so Louie and I today talk a little bit about the 2022 roadmap um, going forward. Uh, I know a lot of people like to say, make Istio boring. And I sort of have the quote, simple as easy and complex as possible. I know it's related to a bunch of other quotes, but um, I, I think the idea is, is we want to make Istio um, the simple things easy. And we want to make sure that the complex things are also possible. Anyway, I want to start out and take a little look back at 2021 and see how some of the work we did in 2021 sets the stage for 2022. Um, a year ago, um, Niraj and Louis basically had a similar presentation here on IstioCon and laid out that the theme for 2021 was day two operations and things were sort of broken down into um, several areas. So we'll just kind of go through some of those here this morning. Um, and some of these things were talked about um, in the opening keynote by um, Lynn and Mitch as well. Um, so looking at, at 2021, some of the things related to um, stability and maintainability of the product. Um, we enhanced the upgrade process um, over a number of releases with release labels. Um, we introduced um, the skip version upgrade um, to allow you to go from say 1.11 to 1.13. Uh, we worked with gateway injection as well as reintroduced a, a simplified helm install. Um, we also improved um, some of the troubleshooting. Um, we added Istio Cuddle Verify Install, and we also did um, some Istio Cuddle Analyzer improvements. Uh, we extended the support window um, by six weeks. Um, so part of the benefit to that is it allowed a twice a year upgrade cadence potentially. Um, so if you wanted to go from 1.11 to 1.13, for example, this additional six weeks um, allowed both of those releases to be under in the support window. Um, we also looked at feature graduation. Um, we have a new process um, that makes feature graduation consistent. So we have a checklist of things that um, a feature needs to do um, to graduate from each phase. And we also uh, work to promote um, movement through those phases. We don't want um, a particular feature stagnant uh, forever. Um, and some of the features that we got promoted to beta included VM support, um, gateway injection, um, the CNI plugin, as well as external control planes. Yeah, so um, it's, you know, the, the, in, in, you know, when we look at this and, you know, you know, when we talk about software development processes, right? Maybe not necessarily the most interesting topic to people who aren't running inside the project, but it's actually really important for what we do. Um, you know, people depend on what we build and ship in production systems, and you know, if those APIs and features are not you know, promoted to stable status, then lots of people are unwilling to use them. Even though they may actually really, really want the feature, they just won't use them because it's not considered a stable feature. So just like in commercial software, right? This is a very important practice for any software, large scale software system to have. Um, and so, you know, this actually took a lot of operational focus within the project over the last year. Uh, and I think we've achieved some pretty, pretty impressive results. All right. Um, and looking at some of the other things, um, we, <laughs> back, yeah, that one. Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> The ex, um, some of the extensions that uh, that we had done, and I, and I know there's some some other presentations during this conference on some of these. Um, we added um, external authorization, um, some things with remote WebAssembly filters, as well as the telemetry API, um, which Mitch has mentioned. We'll talk a lot about in other presentations today in, in the listening group. Um, in terms of trying to increase our operational excellence, excellence. Um, We've tried, we've tried to increase the effectiveness of our CVE patch process. Um, there was a security assessment by the NCC group that was done as well. Um, we tried to have a more consistent patch release schedule. So um, you can expect hopefully a 0 0.1, 0 0.2 sort of patches on a three to four week cadence um, to try to be somewhat more consistent with that. Um, we also try to, from a community standpoint, shorten the time um, from when we do a branch cut to when we actually publish a release. Um, the release managers are very, um, feel this one is pretty important. Um, and it does shorten um, 
it, it, it does shorten the time, which means we have to do some things quicker, but um, we've, we've done that fairly well um, so far um, in 2021. Um, and we wanna continue to drive and integrate um, with others, um, especially things like the, the Kubernetes Gateway API too. So we have people that help drive that API as well as integrate it back into Istio. Yeah, so the on, on the CVE front, right, a lot of time and effort when the project goes into this process, we take CVEs really seriously. Um, if you're working with software that either claims not to have CVEs or doesn't have a CVE management process in place, then I, I think you should take a long and hard look at whether that is actually a, a really an enterprise product. Um, you know, we had several CVEs we had to deal with in 2021, and I think we dealt with them extremely well. Uh, you know, we, we we have a very mature process in place, and we're I'm very proud of what the, the team does in this front. Um, so I, I think that was a, actually a major highlight for us. You know, even though when we do patch releases, obviously that causes some work for everybody, including users. Uh, you know, I think it's critically important that we get these patches out so that if you feel like you're going to be affected, then you can take advantage of the update. Yeah, I was going to say, I think I looked at Istio.io and noted that we had 11 security bulletins, I believe, in 2020, and we were down to eight in 2021. Now, I don't know if that's um, necessarily because anything we've done or just, you know, the upstream as well as our product are, are becoming better. Um, in terms of uh, the usage of um, Service Mesh, um, looked in the 2020 and 2021 um, CNCF annual survey. And if, if you look at um, the number of respondents that um, responded that they currently use in Service Mesh in production, you can see that that's increased um, from 27% in 2020 to 36% in 2021, um, showing that uh, there still is a, a large uptick in um, people putting service mesh into production. And even those evaluating service meshes went from, um, I, I wanna say from 23 to 29% um, between 2020 and 2021. So um, a, lot of, a lot of uptick, a lot of um, people still investigating and, and using the service mesh, so that's good. Um, next, uh, more in, a, in terms of a local survey, um, we do have some Istio, um, user surveys that are done. Um, and I know Mitch showed the chart yesterday in one of his presentations um, based on user feedback, our user satisfaction across the releases in 2021 was increasing, um, which is good. Um, also note that the number of people doing skip level upgrades is up. So we talked about um, skip version support. Um, there are people using that. Um, I believe the numbers were up 5% um, between the couple of releases that I was looking at the data for and the number of single level upgrades is down also about 5%. Um, don't know if we can necessarily attribute, you know, them to being the same 5%, but um, the, the number of people using skip level upgrades is up and single level upgrades is down. Um, and with that, I think I'll turn it over to Louis to set the stage for our roadmap for 2022. Okay. Um... So for those of you who attended this session last year, the, the theme for 2022 will be a complete shock. It is the same theme as it was in 2021. Um, and that's for good reason, right? The, you know, we've made a lot of progress uh, on, on the build, test, release, uh, upgrade, and installation tooling. Um, you know, the statistics Mitch talked about, I mean, uh, Eric talked about, and that Mitch gathered about the upgrade process, um, you know, still show that uh, users would appreciate more investment in that area. Uh, you know, the skip level upgrades were a really important feature, and I think users appreciate them a lot. Um, you know, people only have so much time on their hands to perform software maintenance, and we are definitely not the only piece of software enterprises use. Uh, you're certainly probably performing Kubernetes upgrades if you're doing two upgrades. Um, so, you know, we, we think it's really important and we want to keep that focus that we had last year. And so there's the, a strong roadmap on that front. Um, and then there are some other things that we continue to work on to, you know, in, enhance the, the functional value of the product in addition to making it 
more usable, more maintainable, more performant, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but that, that focus, we thought it just made sense to keep, keep, keep the ball rolling for 2022. So what do we mean when we talk about day two operations? Uh, you know, this, this, this graphic, uh, which I think came from the D zone magazine, um, right in day zero, what you're doing is you're trying to figure out what you want your system to be, right? You're doing your requirements analysis, uh, you know, maybe doing some whiteboarding on the architecture design, right? Writing that down, uh, on day one, right? Once you've figured out what you want to do and use, then you're trying to get it installed, get it set up, get it configured. And so now, now you have a system, uh, you know, possibly in production. And day two, right, you are now maintaining that thing, right? So, you know, with Kubernetes, right, if you've got a big Kubernetes cluster running in your enterprise environment or, or, or lots of them, right, then you are, you know, monitoring them, you are performing maintenance operations on them. Um, you know, maybe you have housekeeping duties such as, you know, deleting applications that are no longer in use or namespaces or, you know, what, whatever needs to be cleaned up. And, and you know, like all of us, uh, there are resource constraints on what, how much money you have, how much compute and uh, you are able to use. Uh, and so you're trying to make sure that you're getting the best bang for your buck out of the system, right? So you're optimizing it. And then, you know, someday, and, you know, from my perspective, hopefully never, uh, you're, you're done with the system and you're, you move on to do this all over again. Uh, so that's what we mean when we talk about day two operations. Um, so, you know, we're going to go through a bunch of focus areas, um, you know, a, along a variety of different themes within the, the project. Um, but uh, I think you'll see, you know, that, that kind of focus uh, shine through in, in the details of what we are about to cover within the uh, roadmap itself. Uh, so at this point, I'm going to hand over to Eric, and he's going to talk about one of uh, the first couple of focus areas, and then he and I are going to go back and forth, and uh, we'll chime in when we we have some useful context to add. Yeah. So so first off, um, one of the things that, that Louis mentioned earlier was um, customers like to see things um, that are stable as opposed to alpha and beta. So we want to continue uh, promoting our APIs um, towards stable. Um, that's one of the things that uh, is very important. Um, an example there might be authorization policy. We want to get that um, to stable. Um, some of the other things to try to get some APIs to stable, um, and this is, you know, telemetry would be one of them, um, is to remove the APIs out of the mesh config and um, basically move them into their own set of APIs um, so that they can get promoted to stable. So telemetry would be one of those um, proxy config I know would be another one that's been um, mentioned here. Um, we want to continue, um, as I said before, with the uh, community, um, the Kubernetes API definition. Um, um, so working with the, the Kubernetes community as well as um, aligning that with the Istio APIs. And so one of the things we want to do is to get the um, Kubernetes Gateway API support um, promoted as well. Um, to beta, I think it's currently alpha. Um, we want to do continue to improve the uh, telemetry API. Um, so some of the things we've done recently there, um, we added support um, for logging with um, open telemetry. Um, so we want to add some additional providers there potentially. Um, we want to be able. You know, we just added the filtering of access logs. Um, so things like workload mode selection um, would be something that we we hope to continue with. Um, and again, um, if anybody has some thoughts on that, um, there were, I'll have a link or at least a, a pointer at the end, as well as um, uh, the, the telemetry API and, and session, as well as the um, listening session. Um, yeah. In terms of upgrades and troubleshooting, um, unless, Lee, do you have anything else in this slide? Well, I was just gonna talk about the, the gateway API for a second. Um, you know, the, the, this has been a major effort within uh, both communities, uh, both the Kubernetes and the S2 community, uh, and you know, it's it's important, right, to realize like the, the the gateway APIs are a very powerful set of networking APIs, and you know, they are going to be a core and supported feature of Istio. Uh, and you know, I, I think because they're now a shared API surface between two large open source communities, they, well, I hate to use the term standard, 
right? They certainly start to look and feel like one. Uh, and so, you know, we remain, we're going to be very committed to supporting and evolving with those APIs and driving that community forward. Uh, and, you know, I think having those APIs in place are going to be a, a, a big benefit to both the Kubernetes and SDO communities. Uh, Right. And so I, I definitely encourage people to take a long look at those. Uh, we, we were one of the first implementations of that API, if not quite the first, certainly very close. Uh, and, and we will continue to track that API and, and deliver that as a stable service within the project. Um, so that, you know, particularly when there are use cases that are outside of what we support today with Istio for networking, which is frankly not that many at this point, um, you know, those APIs should allow for some continuity between Istio and other solutions that you may be using. All right, thank you, Louis. Um, so on the next slide, we're talking a little bit about um, upgrades and troubleshooting improvements we wanna do. Um, so we want to make um, upgrades, uh, you know, give them the ease of an in-place upgrade and the safety of a revision-based um, upgrade. So along that line, we want to promote the um, revision label-based upgrades to stable. Um, I think at, at some point then, we will probably make that the, the recommended approach for some users. Um, we want to continue um, to promote the Helm install um, to beta um, that was reintroduced. I know there's a lot of um, strong, if you will, um, and happiness, I guess, amongst their customers that the, that is back. Um, so that that is good. So we want to continue to promote that to beta. Um, in terms of troubleshooting, um, we want to basically make it so that users spend less time troubleshooting the, the service mesh itself um, and are then able to troubleshoot their services with the service mesh. So um, along those lines, um, we would like to extend some of the current analyzers that we have. Um, as well as adding more analyzers into Istio Cuddle um, to help with that. Um, we want to include analyzers for other environments besides Kubernetes as well. So um, look forward for those sorts of things to come here in 2022. And with that, I think I'll turn the next slide over to Louie. Okay. So uh, you know, there are going to be several talks uh, about the different extensibility points uh, within Istio. Right? The talk later today about the telemetry certainly falls under that category. Um, you know, telemetry is a place where Istio has to integrate with a variety of different uh, you know, telemetry solution providers. You know, whether that's uh, via Open Telemetry or you know, with other systems that have their own proprietary inf interfaces. Um, so you know, we have to design APIs to enable. Uh, extension points to be configured within the system, but also design the API in such a way that that's maintainable. Right? That's that's a, a tricky thing to do, actually. Um, it normally requires you to think long and hard about what abstractions you want to provide for, you know, these kind of implementations that that you need to integrate with, uh, while also giving sufficient control and configurability um, so that you describe how you integrate with those systems. Um, and you know, while also making that API something that can be upgraded from version to version. Um, you know, we released the Envoy filter mechanism uh, a couple of years ago to give people a, a break glass extensibility experience. Um, you know, dropping down into letting you configure Envoy uh, resources directly, uh, while very powerful, also is quite hard to maintain, right? Because the Envoy API surface itself changes over time. And how Istio actually produces the configuration to configure Envoy also changes. And so you know, very low level mechanisms like Envoy filter uh, you know, are not necessarily uh, stable across releases. And so we have to right, spend the time and look at these key integration points and then provide first class APIs that we can then maintain and provide stronger guarantees about uh, upgradability uh, over time. Uh, and so, you know, telemetry is certainly one of those APIs, uh, but there are others that we have been working on over the, the last year. Um, so WebAssembly uh, is, is one of these. Uh, we have a, a WASM plugin API now that enables 
people to declare what WebAssembly modules they want, uh, where they want them to be used, and in what flows within the system they should be enabled. All right. uh, and that API surface is, is, is uh, quite controlled, so we are able to upgrade that across releases and provide strong guarantees while still giving you access to you know, what is an awful lot of capability that you can write via this extension mechanism, right? WebAssembly is uh, a, a, a runtime that allows you to do just about anything you want um, in the data flows that uh, run through the service mesh. Right? So it comes with a lot of power. Um, another one that we have provided over the last year is what we call custom authorization. Um, and so if, if you're using the authorization policy API to you know, grant or deny access to certain uh, operations or uh, resources within your APIs when you know, services call each other, um, you, know, you can allow and deny traffic. Uh, and one of the things that you can now do is use those declarative blocks, um, which are basically saying you know, when this rule should apply, and then say that I want when this rule applies, I want to execute this custom authorizer. Uh, and that custom authorizer supports a, a plugin mechanism that allows you to decide, you know, for instance, when this rule is applied, I should call out to this other system and that other system you know, meets the, the contract of something like the external authorization filter in Envoy. Uh, and then its result will be applied to the traffic. Right? And so it's a way to kind of compose uh, authentication and authorization systems in uh, performant way, in particular. Um, we've also spent quite a bit of time, not just at the API level, but also at the runtime level, looking at how we can normalize the kind of contracts or interfaces with other systems that might be around in the Kubernetes ecosystem so that we can leverage them, right? And so a, a good example of this would be uh, the certificate authorities. Um, so we've standardized how, uh, or the contract we would expect uh, another certificate authority other than Citadel uh, to meet in order for us to be able to use its certificates to run MTLS for all the traffic. Um, and so by standardizing that contract, other CA implementations can now come in and fulfill that contract uh, and can be used in production. Uh, and so we recently actually did this with uh, the Spire CA, right? Uh, if you guys are familiar with that, uh, and validated that can be used in production. Uh, and that Istio can load certificates uh, from it. And this it can rotate certificates and meet all the requirements that we have to maintain that high uh, zero trust security bar that we want to meet. Um, and th the same thing is true for managed gateways. Right. The gateway API, uh, are both ours and the Kubernetes one, right? they al allow for controls for you know, different systems to operate uh, the actual implementations of the gateways. Uh, and so you know, we don't necessarily always want Istio to be the thing you know, making a gateway uh, implementation or a deployment to mirror what uh, a gateway resource says. Sometimes we want other systems to be able to do that. And so we have to be able to cooperate right in this ecosystem with other uh, controllers and things like that. So these aren't necessarily things you would represent as API contracts. They're more like downward facing uh, contracts or kind of ecosystem contracts uh, that are important for us to fulfill. Uh, Eric, any uh, thoughts on this? Um, no, I think that's good. All right. Um, so the other thing that we are, you know, have kind of continuously been chipping away at is just extending the reach of Istio into different environments. Um, you know, we originally had the first versions of Istio pretty much only worked on Kubernetes. Uh, and then, you know, we, we put time and significant effort into enabling Istio to work on VMs. Uh, in particular, when we saw situations where, you know, Users were trying to adopt Kubernetes, but they had workloads that were running on VMs, and they couldn't just not have them talk to each other. Uh, and so, you know, supporting VMs was a way within uh, you know those deployments to facilitate the adoption of Kubernetes. Um, and so, you know, that 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 is as true today as it was when we first uh, created the VM support. Um, but also, these platforms are evolving, and we need to kind of keep pace with what the industry is doing. 
you know, Kubernetes has been adding support for IPv6 and dual stack networking. And so, you know, there are now enough Istio users where we need to support that for them as well. So that was uh, something that we're going to focus on in 2022. Um, obviously, ARM is becoming uh, quite prevalent in deployments at this point. Uh, there are several vendors out there offering ARM, uh, both on the cloud. Uh, I don't think we see as much ARM necessarily in on-premise, but uh, I, you know, I think it's quite likely that we will see that as well at some point. Um, also, the proxyless Istio, right? So there are, are for very very low latency scenarios, right? There, there. I mean, there's a cost to going through the sidecar, uh, and so if you're willing to rewrite your application to use a library like gRPC and adopt all the best practices that it represents, then you know you can actually have a mesh without actually needing the sidecar. Uh, so we've been working with the gRPC team to enable this. Um, obviously, you know, redeveloping your apps is a pretty high bar for a lot of people, and so we don't expect to see this dominate the usage of Istio. But in very high value use cases, I think we'll see a decent amount of adoption of this capability. Uh, and then there's all the performance, ongoing performance work we want to make sure so that Istio is a better fit in you know, ever shrinking environments uh, and that we are responsive to you know, performance concerns, um, whether it's you know, reducing the amount of configuration we send to Envoy so it starts faster. Uh, you know, in making improvements to the Envoy data plane itself so we get latency and resource utilization improvements and so forth. Um, OK, so I'm going to hand it back over to Eric, and he is going to talk about security hardening. Thanks, Louis. Um, yeah, certainly extending the, the reach and the extensibility of, of ISCU are, are big items. We also have some, some other things we want to do. Um, in terms of uh, security and some other improvements. Um, things for security, we want to try to make Istio as secure by default, you know, out of the box as we can. Um, we can't make it totally secure because that makes things complex. We want to keep things simple. Um, but we want to do some things to make it, you know, as secure as we can. Um, and some things to go with that um, are some best practices documentation. We have some out there already um, for security. Um, we want to continue to extend that. Um, and we also have some other best practices documentation that um, we're working on as well, and it has been released. Um, so we'll continue with those as well. Um, I know one of the things that's been mentioned um, in terms of having a mo more secure environment is um, distroless images. I know we have um, talks in Slack or, or chats in Slack and even in, in issues um, talking about the CVEs within the base image. Um, so distroless images will help with that. Um, but one of the big drawbacks with distroless images is their debugability. Um, so one of the things that we're sort of waiting on before um, we get that promoted is the ephemeral container support um, within Kubernetes to um, help facilitate some of that debugging. And, and that works ongoing. So um, look for that promotion to come soon. Um, another thing that people have asked for is a software bill of materials. And I believe we started with the 1.13 release, if not um, very soon after that, um, providing a software bill of materials as part of the artifacts um, that you can that you can get um, off of the release page. Um, in terms of other things to support uh, security and trying to fix some of the problems that are seen is we've added some um, fuzz testing and we want to continue to add additional fuzz testing. Um, this would allow us to find some of these problem areas that we don't know about um, and to fix bugs um, before hopefully uh, customers would run into them. Hopefully we'll find them in our own testing um, framework. Um, did you have something else on security as well, Louis? No, I mean, I just wanted to kind of maybe echo a little bit of what I was talking about before. You know, this represents a significant investment for the project. Right? A lot of time and effort goes into doing these things. Um, they are absolutely necessary for uh, something like Istio to be used in uh, you know, enterprise environments and particularly regulated enterprise environments. Um, and so 
while this is not necessarily the, the most glamorous work, it is absolutely critical to the project uh, and something that we take very seriously. Um, and so hopefully it, you know, at least for some of you, gives you comfort that we spend a lot of time and effort on these things. Um, and you know, I want to thank, uh, in particular, the privacy and security working group within the Istio community for all that they do. Uh, it's, it's a lot of time and effort to drive these processes and these improvements. Um, and it, you know, it doesn't always get the most attention, or, uh, but I, I think it's absolutely critical to what we do. Yeah, I think security is, is you know, also a very important thing. Um, and hopefully we can continue to um, respond to customer concerns as well as um, make it more secure as well. Um, in terms of some other improvements, um, one of the things that we talked about was upgrades. And I know one of the things we want to do is making upgrades easier um, using automation. And I don't know if um, any of you attended uh, Mitch's uh, I think it was upgraded 3,000 proxies overnight talk yesterday. Um, but as part of that, there was um, some talk about automation with, with GitOps and um, trying to move some of that through um, the process as well as um, getting at least a reference implementation out there for that sometime this year, uh, hopefully, as well as looking at some of the other upgrade platforms. I know that... Uh, has come through some of the surveys as well um, to try to simplify um, and make it easier uh, for teams to upgrade Istio. Um, we don't want to, or I should say, you know, you don't want to have to have, you know, five people or, or two people or one person on staff to um, just do upgrades. Um, if we can make this simpler um, and easier and reduce the amount of staff that have to help with the upgrades, that's good. So. Looking into some of the automation with that, uh, we want to look into um, some more larger enterprise customers uh, looking with um, making some changes related to multi and large scale clusters. Um, and one of the other things that we, we sort of talked about users up until now, um, one of the other things we want to look at is ways to improve the Istio community itself. Um, you know, from the person who notices a bug and wants to submit a PR to fix that bug, we want to make that easy and non-trivial for them. Um, also, those people who have a feature that they want to um, potentially promote. So from writing the, the reference documentation through um, getting it implemented through the promotion pipeline, getting it up to stable, um, we want to continue to make that uh, easy process going forward. Um, whether you're a maintainer, um, just somebody who wants to provide something um, in terms of like a bug fix. Um, and so in terms of some of that, we've done a couple of things. Um, we've combined our weekly um, work group meeting or we've combined all of our separate um, work group meetings. Um, so for example, as the test and release work group lead, um, we had a weekly you know, half hour meeting um, as well as all the other work groups um, we're having meetings. Um, so we've now tried to combine that into a single, well, into a single work group meeting, but we have it at multiple times. Um, so right now it's twice a week. Um, we have one on Wednesday um, at a US friendly time and one on Tuesday evening, US time, um, which is more APAC friendly. Um, in, in terms of trying to help those people that might not be in the US have a time that they can meet. Um, and it works to try to make it so that people that want to help you know, with multiple work groups um, can all, you know, only have to you know, potentially join one meeting and not a bunch of meetings. So um, we'll see how that works going forward. Um, I know, Lou, you had some comments about that as well. Yeah, I mean, just more at the high level, I think, you know, one of the, like, aside from all the things that we do within the project, and you know the software that we ship. You know, I think one of the most striking things about 2021 was the growth uh, and of contributions coming from people in China and Asia. Um, and so, you know, it's actually a theme at this conference, right? There are whole chunks of this conference uh, being managed in a China time zone friendly way uh, and with dedicated Chinese uh, content for the China audience. Um, and so. 
know, this is the, the beauty of open source in action, right? You, where the locus of your community is will shift over time. Um, and we want to make sure that we do as much as we can to accommodate uh, people all over the world uh, to make contributions. You know, it's hard, right? Time zones are a real thing and we can't you know, totally uh, avoid the gravity of those things. Um, but I, we are working to be as inclusive as possible. And uh, I, I look forward to seeing the community growth uh, around the world. Because uh, I think what happened in 2021 was actually quite remarkable. Um, so with that, I think we are done for content. Uh, so I'm just going to put up the, uh, the thank right. you slide. And I think we have some questions.